Hello and uh, welcome to this webinar on taking your AUV or ROV to the next level. And welcome back to anyone that joined us yesterday for our sessions on USVs. My name is Aidan Thorne. I'm the Business Development Manager for Marine Robotics at Sonodyne. And I'm here today with Manak Shiva and John Holder from our engineering team, who are going to walk you through some of our technology in a few moments time. Um, we're here at the National Oceanography Centre for this webinar today. And uh, we couldn't think of a better place uh, to hold this webinar as it's the home of the largest fleet in Europe of marine autonomous systems. So we'd like to extend a massive thank you to the National Oceanography Center for extending us, for, for uh, hosting us, sorry, over the last couple of days. Um, it is, however, a working environment. So if you do hear any distractions or noises throughout the session, then please do bear with us a little bit. Um, You'll see on, on, the, on the Zoom call that there is a Q&A box. We really welcome your questions throughout the session today. This sort of thing only works when there are, is, is active participation. So yeah, please do get those questions in and we'll, we'll get those to, to Malik and John throughout the various breaks in, in, their, in their presentations. Okay, myself and John are gonna leave this, the shot now and Malik's gonna take you through the first bit. Thank you. Okay, thanks Aidan. So um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm Malik. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about um, improving the navigation capability of your uh, of your AUV or, or ROV. Uh, and a good example, actually, these um, these two AUVs sort of here at the moment, they're they're both designed to do long duration under ice missions. Uh, and of course, nav navigation is going to be critical for that and, and self-contained navigation without external positioning sort of where needed. Um, for instance, it's not gonna be possible, for instance, for a USBL to potentially follow these where they need to go. Um, and they may not be able to surface to get a, a GPS or, or GNSS fix. So it just, it just shows um, the importance of very good navigation for these, uh, these kind of vehicles and also ROVs as well. So in terms of navigation, our, our primary product for subsea vehicles is our family of, of Sprint Nav, acoustic inertial hybrid navigators. And you can see a few of them here, and I'm gonna sort of explain some of the features of them that we've recently released in a, in a moment. But all of our, um, all of our sprint navs um, come fitted with a high performance inertial uh, navigation system, a Doppler velocity log, and also a high accuracy pressure sensor. Um, and we tightly integrate our sprint nav navigators uh, in two ways. We tightly integrate them mechanically. Um, so you can see, and I'll, I'll sort of show this off a little bit later, that they are integrated. They're very small in terms of size, weight, low power. Um, so there's some mechanical advantages to that. Also, we pre-calibrate them. So you can take them, you can install them on the vehicle, um, and you can just get straight to work and get turnkey navigation capability. Um, it eases the effort of, of mobilization and, and commissioning of the vehicles. And also we tightly integrate at an algorithmic level as well. Um, so we, we tightly um, make fuse the data in our algorithms. Uh, and that means that things like, um, for instance, the Doppler velocity log, where there's multiple transducers, multiple observations, um, we can take individual observations from each of those. And the INS can choose whether to use them or reject them. Um, and the particular benefits by tightly fusing this data is that the navigation performance is significantly improved over, over separate instruments that improve in terms of accuracy and improved in terms of reliability of the, of the navigation. Um, so we talked about the improvements of the, the navigation there, um, but also these instruments can provide position and orientation for other onboard sensors like, um, like multi-beam. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll jump into some of the new versions of these that have been released in the last few months. So starting off with um, our full size sprint nav, which is down the front there. Uh, early this year, we released the highest performance version of sprint nav called sprint nav X. Um, and we've been able to demonstrate that with a series of real time customer demonstrations on unmanned platforms. One that we did that was quite interesting was funded in the UK by our defense and security accelerator. Uh, and what we could do was fit one of these again to an unmanned platform uh, running out of our Plymouth trial center. We could demonstrate the kind of navigation capability of one of these without any external aiding, no GPS, no USBL. And on a 10 kilometer run, we could achieve a navigation error uh, relative to the seabed of, of just less than a meter. 
So that's a, a very, very high level of performance and really quite unprecedented in terms of a commercially available navigation system and particularly one that's uh, not ITAR controlled. So very, very high levels of performance there for the new Sprint Nav X. We've also got the option with Sprint Nav now, and this is across the whole uh, Sprint Nav family, of a higher altitude 400 kilohertz DVL option. And this takes the maximum altitude that the units can achieve bottom lock up to 230 meters. Uh, that widens the operating envelope for the AUVs or ROVs. It means they can operate further from the seabed, but still benefit from that very highly accurate um, seabed relative navigation, even with external positioning has been lost. And again, particularly relevant for um, things like these vehicles that might go under ice. Um, also for ROVs that may need to operate out of sight of USBL around structures, um, things like that. There's some very particular benefits there. So now we'll jump across to the Sprint Nav Mini. Um, and just, uh, just a few weeks ago, we launched the Sprint Nav Mini Navigator. Um, the form factor for the new Navigator version and the earlier guidance one are exactly the same. So we'll just talk about that. Um, as you can see, it's very, very small. It's just 200 millimeters high, uh, very, very lightweight. This is the 300 meter one. I can pick it up in one hand. It's very, very light. And um, we also do a 4,000 meter titanium one. But as I say, this one's a 300 meter one. And we've got various options in terms of configuration. This one has top mount connectors, but for low profile installations on, for instance, small inspection observation class, um, ROV skids um, or smaller AUVs, we have a side connector version as well that lowers the height. Um, and as you can see, it, it's not much taller than, than a standalone DVL, let alone a, a separate INS as well. Um, so again, we've got those packaging benefits there and it is also very low power. Um, but in terms of the navigation performance, there's no real compromise there. It, it offers a very high level of performance. So on the screen now, you should be seeing a kind of survey trajectory that your ROV or AUV might be uh, carrying out, uh, traveling out to a, a site of interest, maybe doing an inspection task or, or something there, a multi-beam survey, for instance, and then returning back to, to be you know, recovered. And on this type of navigation, the Sprint Nav Mini Navigator can achieve uh, self-contained navigation. That's without any external positioning, no USBL, no GPS, of just 0.05% uh, navigation error for the distance traveled. So just 50 centimeters over a kilometer. So, so very, very high performance. And the other thing that we focused on with the Sprint Nav Mini is to try to make it easier to, to operate an interface. So what we've done is put in an embedded browser interface and John's just gonna open that up for you to have a look at. And this is the first dashboard you can see when you connect to the unit, it's a simple glance at what's going on. You can see how the navigation is doing, some of the different aiding sensors, um, a quick overview of the, the navigation, things like that. You can drill a bit deeper. You can go down to the data view and you can get some text outputs there that show, again, a lot more data on the navigation, also the quality metrics, things like that. You can also zip across to the inputs and have a look at some of the input data that's being used by the, uh, the Sprint Nav for aiding, like GPS or USBL, things like that. And then the last little neat feature that I'd like to show you is actually an embedded web chart that we have in there. This is a nice, easy way to just visualize the navigation of the Sprint Nav Mini uh, and also its error ellipse. You can see there is the sort of the, the green circle. And you can also see that relative to the, the aiding that, that, that might be available like uh, USBL or, um, or GPS. So quite a neat little interface. Um, it means that um, yourselves as installator, it, inst installing these and operators, you don't need to use external software. You can just connect by your web browser um, and see how the unit's doing and configure it. So very easy to use. And so some sort of news hot off the press um, is that uh, recently uh, Ctronics have selected Sprint Nav Mini Navigator for installation on their Valor ROV, which is, is great news. And we're very happy to be working with them on that. And there's a really good match there because the Valor ROV is, is really one of the most powerful observation class ROVs. Um, it's very capable. It's designed to perform tasks that larger ROVs um, would normally do. So it, it, it's cheaper, it sort of punches above its weight. And with Sprint Nav Mini Navigator, with it having the, the sort of really lowest size weight and performance in its class, but still class leading nav, 
um, we believe they're a perfect match. Um, so we've got a very sort of small, but very, very capable cost-effective package to do demanding missions in, in wind farms, IRM, um, defense, those kinds of things. So again, we're very, very pleased that uh, Seatronics have, have selected us for that. Um, so that was a real quick sort of run through of some of the, the new versions we've got in our Sprint Nav family. So we have some questions coming in and I think Aidan's gonna join me and we can see if we can get some of those answered for you. Thanks for that, Malik. Um, so you've talked a bit about the size and weight of this and it's very clear and apparent from just looking at the, the, the piece of kit here, but you also talked about power. What is the power consumption of the Sprint Nav Mini? Sure, yeah, well, the Sprint Nav Mini, um, it normally uses just 10 watts um, and compared to even sort of mini, uh, separate mini INS and a, a separate mini DVL, um, if you look at the power consumption of those, you'll be using about 30% less power with a Sprint Nav Mini, which is power that you could be using for something else, more payload sensors, extending the duration of your, your mission, something like that. So again, sort of quite class leading there. Great, and uh, yesterday in the USV session, you also mentioned uh, the ability to have a 200 meter altitude. Um, obviously that's useful on a USV, but why is that useful in an AUV or an ROV? Sure, well, I think if we, if we think about the types of vehicles, that would um, potentially use a Sprint Nav Mini, like uh, maybe a, a small, smaller inspection observation class ROV or, or a small to medium AUV that might be doing, say, mine counter work. They, they can often operate in shallower water mm -hmm. um, and you know, quite often maybe in, in water that is actually uh, you know, below 200 meters. So what that means is if those vehicles have a GPS um, and they can achieve bottom lock with the 200 meters altitude, um, it means as they start to descend and lose GPS, there won't be any navigation drift because the unit already has bottom lock mm -hmm. and you can benefit from that very, very um, accurate seabed relative navigation. So it means that that navigation isn't going to be reduced during the descent phase at all. Great, thanks. So no more questions for Malik right at this point, but do please do keep those questions coming in. Uh, there'll be another opportunity to talk to Malik at the end of the session. But for now, we're going to hand over to John. That's great. Thanks, Malik. Thanks, Aidan. So that was Malik introducing our kind of range of hybrid acoustic inertial navigators. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about now is um, what can we do for ROVs, AUVs, uh, UUVs in the kind of USBL positioning sphere, uh, and also some talking about communications as well. Um, so USBL at Sony Dyna normally means Ranger 2. Uh, Ranger 2 is our kind of flagship USBL product is really great because it's a scalable product. And what do I mean by scalable? Uh, primarily, I mean that the user interface always stays the same, regardless of the accuracy of the Ranger 2 system that you select. Um, so if you do any training on that system, you can stay really familiar with it, regardless of the actual accuracy that you use beneath it. So what I'll do is I'll just start off by going through kind of uh, our basic systems all the way up to our kind of really accurate pro systems and, and everything else in between. So there's three main systems at Sonodyne. Uh, we start off with our micro ranger system. Uh, we actually refreshed that system in kind of May or, or, or June of this year. Um, so the micro ranger system now is really portable, it comes in an IP67 pedi case with all the kit you need, including GPS and transponders uh, and battery as well. So you can run that on any kind of vessel of opportunity or, or small platform. And what does that mean for you as an ROV or, or AEV operator? As an ROV operator, especially in the kind of inspection class world and, and possibly slightly bigger, it means if you're just doing a harbour wall inspection or working near something, you can really quickly deploy that USBL. Um, and also for AUVs as well, you can have the, the robotics pack with Mike Ranger. The robotics pack is something I'll talk about more later. Um, but for AUVs, it's also really powerful because we find that lots of AUV development programs might start off with Mike Ranger and then later on might upgrade to a, to a bigger system to go offshore with, or they might rent a system for their, for their final offshore trials. And that interface stays the same. Uh, what a lot of people care about when it comes to a USBL system is, is really the system accuracy. So that micro ranger will give you between three and 5% of slant range accuracy. So at hundred meters away from the USBL, you're looking at three or five meters of error. Uh, and that depends on the external sensors that you interface or the external sensors that you, you choose not to interface. Uh, so that's micro ranger two. Any questions about that, do fire them in at the end, or, or after this, we'll do a kind of question session midway as well. So after Micro Ranger, you really go to our, our Mini Ranger 2 system. So that's with a Mini Ranger 2 system, you'd always have one of these HBT 3000 USBLs. 
Um, really good USBL with, with a planar array that's, that's very hard to damage and tracks well at high elevation. Um, this HP3000 USBL and, and Mini Ranger as a whole is what we see most of in the kind of nearshore survey industry, anyone track, tracking ROVs and wind farms or, or people tracking towed objects. Uh, or also, if you just want to track your AEV at a slightly longer range than you might get with the micro ranger system as well. Accuracy wise, um, if you use the internal sensors in this, you're looking at around 1.2% of slant range error that you can achieve. Uh, if you choose to use an external sensor, so an external AHARS, uh, you're looking more down at the 0.1% to 0.2% slant range accuracy. So once you get to that level of accuracy, you're, you're really being able to deliver full kind of multi-beam survey deliverables uh, with USBL, especially with USBL and INS. Uh, so Mini Ranger 2 is what we see most of in that kind of nearshore survey ROV world. But if you want to go bigger than that, or you want to go deeper, more accurate, uh, then there's a kind of a step up from Mini Ranger 2, which is our kind of Ranger 2 Pro systems, which often use our, our gyro USBL transceivers. Uh, the gyro USBL transceiver is really accurate and really powerful. Uh, by accurate, I mean they can go up to 0.04% of slant range. Uh, so that's, that's really accurate, much more than the Mini Ranger 2 and, and really class leading in that deep water environment. And they'll also do ranges from kind of right at the surface if you want to do long layback tracking, all the way down to kind of full ocean depth if you're looking at LMF systems as well. So an LMF system or, or a long range system would be the kind of system the NOC would use to track their, their ROV behind us at the moment. So if you want to go deep and accurate, it says Ranger 2 and the Jaro USBLs. And the great thing, once again, is that that Ranger 2 functionality is independent of that accuracy. So if your Micro Ranger, your Jaro USBL, they all interface exactly the same. But if you're tracking an ROV or an AUV, you kind of, what information do you need? Uh, there's always this common information that you need. Uh, and if you're an ROV supervisor, AUV supervisor, or, or anyone working with underwater vehicles, you always need to, need to know where that vehicle is. That, that's your basic information. The next thing that you might want to do also quite basic is to, is to aid an INS with that derived or that calculated position as well. And it's great at Sony Dime that we can do that either cabled in the traditional use case, or we can do it acoustically, which I'll talk about in just one minute. Uh, but let's start off with, with ROVs. I spoke a little bit about what we can do with Micro Ranger and uh, the smaller vehicles, but we're, we're standing in front of this, this huge work class ROV at the NOC. So it's their, it's their six and a half thousand meter rated uh, ISIS vehicle. Um, they would normally use this with one of our, our WMT6s, uh, so something like this, but actually a bit bigger and a bit more powerful to really punch down to that six and a half thousand meters. Uh, it's actually on the, on the port side of the ROV over there. Uh, and they would track that ROV, really easy to set up in Ranger 2 uh, for that track and go use cases. So their ROV pilots know exactly where the vehicle is. And also they maybe use some of our deep marker beacons as well to, to navigate that ROV back to a location that it might have previously visited. Also, they do a lot of multi-beam on this vehicle at the NOC, lots of kind of sampling. Um, so they'll use a, the kind of calculated position from the USBL and they'll use that to aid their onboard INS system as well. So that's kind of, yeah, uh, if you've got a big vehicle. Uh, but what about the use case I was talking over with, with a, a small inspection class? One of the big things we've done recently for small kind of ROVs is our nanotransponder. So our nanotransponder is a, a really tiny transponder it's very omnidirectional, so this, uh, this receive element is equally as good at the side as it is at the top. Uh, and acoustically, it's, it's just as good as its bigger brother, the kind of WASM 6 Plus, which is a traditional Sonodyne shallow water transponder. Um, we also make a, a few variants that you've probably got on your screen now. And we've got a cabled variant that I've got here, which has uh, the ability to put power in and also the ability to do kind of responder and serial communications to that transponder. Uh, so that's really powerful if you want to kind of permanently deploy your ROV on the seabed. Uh, and all these kind of nanotransponders have a 500 meter depth rating as well. So great for kind of inspection class ROV work in wind farms. And that was kind of two of the nano variants, but there's also an OEM nanotransponder as well. But that was kind of, yeah, uh, ROV tracking. Uh, how about if you want to track our AUV, for example? Um, well, then you have to go beyond that, beyond that common use case of just where is my vehicle? Uh, so you're tracking an AEV, you want to know where it is. You also really want to tell that AEV where it is because there's a lot of situations where an AEV needs to constrain its navigation. And the best way to constrain navigation is always to feed an absolute position into that navigation 
into that INS, either Sonodyne or, or a third party INS. The next thing you might want to do is, is piggyback communications on that tracking. And you may also want to do kind of a long data upload with that AUV. Uh, so what we do at Sonodyne in that kind of AUV sphere, uh, most of that functionality is enabled by the robotics pack, which is functionality that lives both in the kind of Avtrack 6 transceiver uh, and in the Ranger 2 USBL software as well. Uh, so there'll be a lot of demonstrations in, in a few minutes of that Ranger 2 robotics pack. Uh, it's a proprietary but freely available API. Uh, and the great thing about it is that we've got uh, loads of experience. That product that's been offered by Sonodyne for multiple years now. That means that our kind of support staff, our integration engineers, and our kind of wiki and our knowledge base on the website are really well set up to give you support to, to integrate that into your vehicle. Um, and that's what I'll be demonstrating some of those simulation tools in, in just a few minutes. So um, Avtrack 6, what can it do? You've always got a, a USBL system on the surface doing the tracking. Uh, and then you'll have one of these Avtrack 6 nano beacons, or you'll have something kind of this size, of a full size Avtrack 6. Um, differences in power level and kind of the range they can operate over, depth rating. Uh, but there's no difference in the functionality that they offer, and that's key. Um, so they can all do modem uploads, which I mentioned, and that's modem from, from any of our devices. They can also do SMS tracking, where we're piggybacking communications on the tracking, and we're doing the, the management of that scheduling. Also position updates, and this is really key and something that I'll show in a minute. Uh, and of course they can do that, that normal tracking as well. Uh, but with Avtrack 6 Nano, um, this version is new, kind of May this year, exactly the same time as we, we kind of refreshed the whole Nano family. We also released the Avtrack 6 Nano. So that house version is new, but we of course also do the OEM version that we've done for a couple of years now, uh, and which is on lots and lots of swarming and, and micro and small AUVs as well. Um, one thing also to mention with this and the Nano to some extent is that, that OEM version, if you're designing a really compact micro or, or small AUV, a really small diameter AUV, and you want a really neat acoustic integration, uh, that OEM transducer that you fit on the outside of your vehicle, uh, we've customized loads of those recently for different AUV and ROV manufacturers. Um, so come to us if you've, got, if you've got a weird design that you want for the transducer to fit in your bulkheads, and, and we can certainly talk about that. Uh, but what I really want to show you now is some of that, those robotics pack demos that, that we've spoken about, because uh, there's a new functionality for the Avtrack 6 and Avtrack 6 Nano, which, which came out this summer. Um, and it helps, helps me also show kind of the sim, some of the simulation tools, which might help you integrate our kind of products into your ROV or, or your AUV platform as well. Uh, so what we've got on the screen now is, a, is kind of our Ranger 2 software. So this is the kind of interface that you'll be familiar with if you ever used Ranger 2, uh, kind of any of that range of products. Um, and we're right here at the NOC, we're, we're near the water, but we don't have any kit in the water. So on my laptop, we're operating a completely kind of simulated environment. And that's something that NOC do a lot with our kit because uh, it allows them to, to test the hardware and uh, sorry, test the hardware, test the software, test their integration ahead of going on an expensive sea trial to Loch Ness or out on the James Cook or the Discovery there, there too research vessels. So you're saving time by doing it all up front in software. Uh, and you also might want to use a micro ranger uh, in a near shore environment before you go fully offshore as well. So here we're tracking kind of three, uh, let's say, let's call them AUVs in the water. Um, and I've got, a, I've got a simulator job going on in the background as well. So this simulator software is software that we freely give away with, with any of the kind of products. It's also something that's quite neat that if we go for one of our products, we can give you the simulator ahead of the delivery of the hardware as well, which is really nice to get, get up and running. Really easy drag and drop. So I've got three vehicles and I've given them dynamic motion and, and real world positions so that when they're tracked in Ranger 2, they are, they are moving. You can set different depth levels, that kind of thing. And you can drag and drop any of our transceivers onto that platform as well. And uh, we develop on this simulator as well. So it exactly matches the, the interface on the real instruments. Um, so I know I'll just flick back to Ranger 2, but that's the simulator software. Any questions on that simulator software, do, do put them in the questions at the end and, and we can certainly answer them. But yeah, as you can see now, I've got Ranger 2 tracking. Uh, if I go into my beacons menu, which is kind of where you configure the setup for the acoustics, right? You can see we've got telemetry tracking enabled. Telemetry tracking is what I spoke about earlier, where we, we track a, a fleet or a swarm of AUVs so up to 10 at a time. Uh, we calculate the positions of those vehicles or the positions more accurately of, of the Avtrack 6 Nano or Avtrack 6 on the vehicle. Uh, and then we send that position down to the vehicle to the Avtrack 6 Nano, right? So now if I connect to just, I'm connected to the serial port 
of this Abtract 6 Nano. You can see this is the kind of information that's coming out. Um, I'm not going to expect you to pass this in, in real time. So I'll just kind of talk you through what's going on. The first bit of the message is uh, the position of the vessel. And then we're tracking three vehicles. So we've got uh, three sets of vehicle locations. So the vehicle know, vehicles know where they are, where every other vehicle in the swarm is, and also where the, where the top side vessel is as well. So really important localizing information. But that's a proprietary message. What if you just want to really simply aid your Sonodyne Sprint Nav, Sprint Nav Mini, or, or any INS? Uh, then we also support, this is quite new this summer, two industry standard telegrams out of the Abtrack 6 Nano and out of the Abtrack 6. Uh, and they're uh, either a GGA or, or a PCM SSB message. So what you can do now is I've just sent a, a command to that Nano. And you see that now every time we're tracking this Abtrack 6 Nano, out of the bottom of that Abtrack 6 Nano is coming a GGA message, which will accept natively. Uh, and, and every other manufacturer of, of any kind of navigation system will accept natively as an aiding source. Um, and then I can change that to a, to a PCM SSB, which is another really industry standard USBL telegram. So feed that straight via a cable into your inertial navigation system. So it's a really no frills way of, of aiding that navigation. Uh, so that's kind of a, just a quick introduction to, I guess, Ranger 2, 6G simulator, uh, and kind of the outputs that are possible from an Avtrack 6 Nano. Uh, but I can actually see that I think we've got some questions coming in. Uh, so I think Aidan's going to come in and, and fire some questions at me. Thanks very much, John. Yeah, we do have a few questions coming in, as you say. So. Um... The first one, John, is where can I get a table comparing the performance of systems side by side? Yep, so I believe uh, we can probably get in touch with you, but I think on the website there's, there's tables of uh, comparisons, especially for our sprint labs and the INSs, comparing their performance, uh, and definitely in the acoustics as well. Uh, but I can get in contact with you later and we can, uh, we can reach out and compare some systems for you, no problem. John, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you talked about this work pass RLV mm -hmm. quite a bit, but um, what's the ideal setup for an inspection class ROV? So for an inspection class ROV, um, it depends what you're doing, really. But um, normally you'd be looking at a nano transponder. They're normally working shallower than 500 meters inspection class ROVs. Um, so you might track that with a kind of mini Ranger 2 USBL system. Um, and then ideally, if you've got a kind of survey deliverable or you want high accuracy kind of navigation tagging for your, your video deliverable, uh, you might have an INS or something like a Sprint Nav Mini. Uh, and then simply output the position, calculate it from the nano, down your tether into that Sprint Nav Mini and um, tie the whole system together in the real world. So, thanks. And uh, next one was, how would I connect the GGA message you suggested to my AUV? So yeah, it, it comes out you know, on one of these Abstract 6 nanos over RS232 or, or 3B3 as well. Uh, simply connect it straight to the kind of serial port on a Sprint Nav or a Sprint Nav Mini. Uh, or alternatively, if you want to put your AUV control system in the middle, uh, that's also really recommended because then you can be in control of the communications that's going to and from. So you can start taking advantage of uh, the ability to piggyback communications and send messages while we do the tracking as well. Uh, and also gives you some redundancy so that, so that you're in control of the system. Good stuff. Thanks, John. So um, more opportunities for questions uh, with John later. John's going to go through some optical um, options for you now, but there won't be a Q&A at the end of this session, but there will be opportunity for, for John uh, for questions on that and anything else for John after that uh, at the end of the session. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Aidan. Uh, so, so optical communications, uh, we haven't spoken about these yet in, in any of our kind of webinars for the last couple of days. Uh, acoustics is great if you want to track over long ranges at reasonably slow data rates and you want really reliable communications over those ranges as well. Uh, but what if you, you want a, or you want or you need a bandwidth that's not just not possible with acoustics? Uh, well, then you need to start looking at optical, optical communications. Uh, so at Sony Dime, we make kind of two primary optical communication systems and there's a couple of flavors of systems within there as well. The primary system that we see at Sonodyne is our, is our Bluecom 200 and Bluecom 200 UV systems. Uh, so Bluecom 200, uh, we make it in a, a blue and a UV. Uh, the blue system is really good if you want to go really dark and deep. So normally at Sonodyne, we say that you start getting into the deep dark ocean when you're deeper than 300 meters. Uh, but the Bluecom 200 UV is quite sensitive to that. The Bluecom 200, sorry, is sensitive to that kind of ambient light. But what that does mean is because there's no ambient light, you can get really long ranges with that. So if a wide area of vehicle control with a Bluecom 200, you're looking at 10 megabits per second kind of bandwidth over 150 meters of range. 
Uh, but what if you want to go kind of shallower than that, or you want to work in high ambient light conditions or with all your ROV lighting turned on all the time? Uh, then you probably want to look at our, our Bluecom 200 UV system, which is actually the one where we're seeing the most use of at the moment uh, in lots of resident and, and other vehicle programs. Uh, the Bluecom 200 UV will do uh, 10 megabits per second at 75 meters range in high ambient light conditions, so in shallow water. Uh, and that's where a lot of operations are, are happening nowadays. Um, we've done some really recent uh, and interesting demos uh, with the Saab Sabertooth vehicle uh, and actually uh, the Oceaneering Freedom vehicle over the last couple of years in Scandinavia. Uh, and those vehicles, they're, they're primarily a really complex and, and advanced autonomous docking system. Uh, but it's nice kind of almost when they're training that to have some, uh, some management and some oversight and often Bluecom 200 UV is used for that wide area control as well. Uh, also, one, one thing, if you want a bit of an explanation about Bluecom 200, there's some really good videos on our website. Uh, and one of the great things we do with Bluecom 200 as well is that um, we can make different colors. So because of the light spectrum and how it gets absorbed into water, uh, we can do some special colors. Uh, so Bluecom 200 green, we actually use for the, the deepest uh, optical communications transfer of data and live streaming video uh, with Sky out in the Maldives uh, just two years ago. That's a really interesting video uh, from the deep ocean in, in a man submersible. So Bluecom 200, 200 UV for those wide area controls. Uh, if you want higher bandwidth than that even further and you, and you don't really care about the directionality, Bluecom 200 is completely omnidirectional. We make a laser-based system now called Bluecom 5000. Uh, and this is a really, has really class leading speeds. That would do 1000 megabits at uh, 30 centimeters. So that's kind of an order of magnitude bigger than any of the normal contactless docking technologies out there. So that's great for resident ROVs and resident AUVs again, for rapidly offloading that data at short distances. Um, but that same unit can also offload data at, at up to 500 megabits per second uh, at a five meter range. So we're seeing some use cases for that in deep water kind of nodal surveys or, or anything that might want to covertly turn up and, and suck up a massive volume of data onto a resident ROV or an AUV uh, really, really quickly. Um, so that's Bluecom 5000, quite new to Sonodyne. If you think that's something you might be interested in, uh, so it's certainly something I'm interested in. So do put any questions at the end uh, and also get in contact after the webinar. Uh, so that's a, kind of me done for optical and acoustics for a while. Uh, now Malik's gonna come back and talk about how we integrate all of our Sonodyne systems uh, into integrated solutions. Okay, thanks, John. Um... So um, as John said, I'm going to talk about uh, integrating um, some of these solutions. So hopefully you, you've been able to sort of get a feel for, for what we can do in, in helping you position your, your subsea vehicles, communicate with them, um, and also provide safe and accurate navigation. So we can obviously bring these together to provide a complete suite of, of products for your vehicles. Um, and thinking about some of the examples we, uh, that John talked about earlier, combining acoustics with your USBL, um, with the telemetry tracking that seamlessly provides position to the USBL system through to something like our, our Sprint Nav um, or Sprint Nav Minis. Um, so bringing those together into a complete suite of solutions and the seamless integration means that hopefully we're gonna be saving you a lot of time and that you can just come and work with us and we can provide you a complete suite of products, but also they, they will seamlessly integrate. We've optimized them to work together. So with their large displacement AUV, this is, what this is exactly what Dive Technologies chose to do when they selected uh, both our, our Avtrack acoustic transceiver and our Sprint Nav X hybrid navigator for their large displacement AUV. It, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it gives them the ability to reliably communicate and track the vehicle with USBL whilst they're simultaneously positioning, passing that, that aiding through to the onboard Sprint Nav X, uh, which is greatly reducing the, um, greatly improving, I should say, the precision of that USBL. And as we spoke about earlier, in times when the vehicle needs to operate away from the USBL tracking, um, it has Sprint Nav X, which is pretty much the highest level of performance you can get sort of off the shelf in, in terms of a navigator for, a, uh, for an AUV at the commercial level. Okay, so that's looking at a complete suite of products for something like an AUV. So what about bringing things together mechanically? Well, that's also something else we can help out with. So something we, we can provide, um, we have provided for some folks are 
integrated payload sections. So you can see a few of them on your screen. Um, the examples here bring together those acoustic elements, the comms and the positioning, um, tightly integrated on board with a pre-calibrated uh, hybrid navigator. It could be a Sprint Nav or, or a Sprint Nav Mini. We can provide those ready configured, ready to go with choices of connectors. Again, pre-configured, pre-calibrated, so they can just be put on board um, and then you can get straight on with, uh, with your mission without having to kind of configure them or calibrate them. So saving you hopefully a lot of time. And then thinking beyond the sort of navigation and comms payloads to imaging, that, that's also something that we can, uh, we can help with hopefully, and uh, particularly with, uh, with our sister companies. So looking at, first of all at, at Voice, um, as some of you know, they're our sister company and they provide a laser imaging and stills camera solution for subsea vehicles. Well, they have a number of different payloads for both ROV and AUV that we can integrate our navigation with to provide a, a one, stop ready configured solution for that. So there's a couple on the screen that you can see. Uh, the first one is, is the Recon AUV imaging payload. So again, it has that integrated laser optical camera system and our solstice side scan sonar. So you can use that for large scale um, target identification. And then you have the imaging solutions on board to then go in and, and image those with, uh, with high resolution, high accuracy. And even better with our sister company, Ivor on board, um, you can actually have that, that imaging both from the sonar and the cameras and the laser, laser be automatically um, kind of uh, identifying targets and also classifying the targets with the onboard machine learning. And then looking beyond the AUV side, you then get into the, the ROV side. And again, uh, Voice have a number of uh, integrated payload skids, both for small ROVs that could be, for instance, like the Valor that we saw earlier or a video array defender um, or larger uh, perception skids for work class ROVs, you know, not dissimilar to the, the ISIS ROV that you saw before John earlier, but also, you know, skids from the sort of uh, major manufacturing operators like sort of oceaneering or, or shilling. So a number of different solutions there on the imaging side. So just the last thing that I'd like to sort of uh, explain in terms of trying to make life easier for you in integrating these sensors onto your vehicles is we have actually started to make freely available now the code samples and drivers that you can use to to interface with the instruments themselves so on the screen at the moment um, you'll see our website and it's a sprint nav mini and you can see that if you scroll down to the bottom there there's a number of different links and one of them in the in the downloads and support section you can click through that it will take you to our external uh, freely available GitHub repository. And there's some sample code there ready that will decode one of the most common messages from the Sprint Nav Mini Navigator in terms of position, uh, navigation and quality. So the codes there ready to go, it will decode that message, put it into structures that you can use straight away on board your vehicle. So saving hopefully a lot of time. We'll be adding more of these, particularly things like ROS drivers as well. To, uh, to many of the, um, the products uh, that we've spoken about today and the product pages on the internet, on our internet page themselves. So please, for the products you've seen today and ones you're interested in, please do keep coming back to the website. And over time, you'll see more and more of these um, code samples and drivers available and other um, tools to make it as easy as possible for you to integrate and use the, um, use the products. Okay, so with that, we're sort of unfortunately running um, towards the end of the session. So. We'll have a last Q&A session and for that I'll be joined by Aidan and John and we'll try to answer at least a few of your questions before we have to go today. Thanks very much Malik and thanks John as well. Um, we did have a question about lead times earlier. What we'll say on that is do get in touch with your regional office and they can walk you through anything to do with our products. Um, so yeah, if you do want to get in touch with the regional office, if you're not already in touch with them, just go to the sonarline.com website and uh, find out which where your re regional office is and we can help you out from there. Okay, so um, first question to you, John, um, you talked about some optical um, systems and some acoustic systems earlier. When would you choose which, basically? Uh, it really depends on what, on what you want to achieve. Yeah, so long range communication, you're always gonna go for acoustic. Uh, short range, you might wanna go for optical, uh, but there's probably a really nice middle ground for 
having maybe both on your vehicle and uh, using the acoustic or the optical, sorry, for your short range high bandwidth comms uh, and the acoustic to do all of that, but also the long range comms as well. Great, thank you. And uh, Malik, one for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Can Sprint Nav be used as an ADCP? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so, so the, the full size Sprint Nav at the front there, it, it can be used as an ADCP. Um, it can collect uh, water current data alongside the, the seabed bottom relative velocities. And it can do that at the same time. So it can flip between a, a bottom track ping and a water track ping. Um, and it can um, collect data at just a single layer in the water column or, or take a slice through um, you know, a large swath of the, the water column. And even better, because the Sprint Nav Mini um, obviously has an idea of its own position and its orientation, it can um, automatically compensate your water profile data on board while it's collecting it. So it's another task that doesn't have to be done after a mission to bring that data together. All right, thank you. Um, John, Avtrax, um, you talked about being able to talk to 10 of them at a time, but can they talk to each other? Yeah, so an Avtrax is a, is a fully functioning transceiver. So it can receive communications from a USBL, but it can also talk to other Avtrax 6s and Avtrax 6 nanos. Uh, in groups of up to 10 or, or even bigger than that. Stuff, thank you. A uh, couple more sprint nav questions, Malik. Sure. Um, I'm going to put them together. Um, first one was how does the sprint nav mini, uh, sorry, does the sprint nav mini have a couple of USBL cor corrections? Mm -hmm. And there was also one can you use the web interface just, uh, on the sprint nav mini at the same time? as any other data outputs? Sure, okay, they're, they're two good questions, so I'll answer those. So if we go for the first one with the um, USBL side of things, so um, so Sprint Nav Mini and, and the, the full-size Sprint Nav there, they can both take USBL observations and improve the, uh, use them to improve the position of the precision of just USBL observations. So to give an example, um, if you have USBL coming in, and it's slightly jumpy with depth. Um, Long-term accuracy is good. Precision is not so good. Um, they will bring the uh, the positions in in tighter, much much tighter. And for example, with Sprint Nav Mini, it will improve that precision by about five times. So so quite a big jump. And the other question was from uh, Malcolm. Uh, so good to have a question from you, Malcolm. Um, so um, in terms of actually concurrent connections to the Sprint Nav Mini's um, interfaces. So you can have concurrent connections um, and, and, and many of them actually. So for an example, um, you can actually have multiple connections to the web user interface that we showed earlier. You, you could even have sort of three or four of them. I personally used two at once. Um, while you have that um, on separate ethernet ports, you could have uh, data coming in. Again, multiples of those, at least three or four, I personally tested at the same time alongside two interfaces and then have a, a, a wide range of outputs coming out, even at high rates of up to, you know, um, 100 hertz out of other ethernet ports. You can have a, so in summary, you can have multiple input connections, multiple output connections, and multiple web browser sessions all at the same time. Great, thanks, Malik. Um, back to you, John. Um, you talked a little bit about the Bluecom uh, and how, how light affects it, but how much does sunlight affect the Bluecom 200 UV? So the Bluecom 200 UV, um, Light is always going to affect an, an optical communication system, uh, but the Bluecom 200 UV, we use special LEDs which transmit uh, with uh, UV light in there so it can, it can break through that. And we also have a neutral density filter on the receivers. Uh, and the Bluecom 200, uh, compared to other optical communication systems, they're, they're a much longer package. And that's because we've got a, a much bigger photovoltaic tube in there. And that means we're much more sensitive to the light and the information that, that we want to collect, uh, which means that in kind of shallow water, high ambient light, the, the range will be affected, but uh, nowhere near as much as some other systems, for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Avtrack communication settings, can they be reconfigured remotely while the vehicles are deployed? Is that so communication settings for the output of the GGA message and things possibly? Um, yep, that could be configured. All of the commands that you can send to our beacons locally by the serial port, you can also send acoustically as well for remote configuration and that we have a, a really well-defined protocol document if you want to modify any of those settings on the fly as well. Right. And we have uh, just one more question we can deal with now, but let's say we will get to any questions that we haven't uh, had time to deal with. Uh, we will get back to you uh, separately. So um, just one more question now. Um, 
Nathan really likes uh, the custom packages for the smaller AUVs, but do we happen to have any uh, packages already designed for the either Scanfish 3? Um, so I will partially answer this question. Um, I have to admit I'm not an expert on, on either Scanfish in terms of the specific models, other than uh, we already integrate um, some of our uh, navigation systems onto some of the Scanfish models already. Um, and certainly with SprintNav Mini Navigator, um, we now have a much smaller form factor to install on uh, more of those. Um, so long story short, we already installed some of these on some of the Scanfish models. And with SprintNav Mini Navigator and its small size, we can install this on more. And it's something that uh, as our sister company, we are speaking with Ivor about. So it's a specific question that I think we can take to, to Ivor and come back to you on. Great, thanks Malik and thanks John. Um, just a reminder that if you do want to get in touch with us, the best way to do that is through your regional office and the say details are on that website, sonodine.com. I want to say thank you once again to the National Oceanographic Centre for allowing us to be here over the last couple of days to host our, both our USV and our this AUV ROV webinar. It's been really invaluable to be here for the last couple of days and uh, yeah, great, great to have these vehicles that we can, we can stand around and, and demonstrate where, where our kit goes. Um, another thing to talk about is our presence at Ocean Business next month. So Ocean Business is happening here again at the National Ocean Office Centre, um, 12th to the 14th of October. There are a number of ways that you can uh, interact with us during that, um, that, that event. We have uh, obviously got a stand. Our stand is not the E1. Uh, we are also have a live demonstration area. So throughout the three days of, of the event, there will be live demonstrations going on in the dock here in Southampton. Um, on both USV and uh, UUV vehicles. So you'll see a lot of the technology we've talked about today being demonstrated here in the dock. And both Malik and I will be part of the autonomy section of the uh, conference at Ocean Business. So I just wanna say thank you once again for joining us uh, for this webinar today. Uh, sorry, I saw that there was a comment that there were some sound issues earlier. Sorry if you had any, uh, were affected by that in any way. We are competing with a cruise ship that's playing its, uh, its music at the moment, unfortunately. So I'm not sure if that's coming across, um, but, uh, yeah, we, we are having a bit of an issue with that here. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you in person, maybe at Ocean Business or maybe at a future webinar. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.